Hello, everyone. Welcome. <clears throat> thank you much. Thank, thank you so much for joining us for Love Think Books. Welcomes author Catherine Angel, who will discuss her new book, Tomorrow Sex Will Be Good Again Women and Desire in the Age of Consent. <clears throat> Angel will be in conversation with founder and director of the Feminist Research on Gender and Sexuality Group at Arizona State University, Brianne Faz. Love Pink Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Catherine and Brienne, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. Love Pink Books offers curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. We are happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a copy for you or for your friends at left-bank.com. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating. It allows us to keep this incredible author event series going. So thank you for your support. We need your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event. So please type your questions as a comment and we will get to those. Be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. We have so many incredible events lined up for the year and are adding events daily. About today's book. Tomorrow, Sex Will Be Good Again. A provocative, elegantly written analysis of female desire, consent, and sexuality in the age of Me Too. Women are in a bind. In the name of consent and empowerment, they must proclaim their desires clearly and confidently. Yet, sex researchers suggest that women's desire is often slow to emerge, and men are keen to insist that they know what women and their bodies want. Meanwhile, sexual violence abounds. How can women in this environment possibly know what they want and why do we expect them to? In this elegant searching book, spanning science and popular culture, pornography and literature, debates on Me Too, consent and feminism, Catherine Angel challenges our assumptions about women's desire. Why, she asks, should they be expected to know their desires? And how do we take sexual violence seriously when not knowing what we want is key to both eroticism and personhood? In today's crucial moment of renewed attention to violence and power, Angel urges us, urges that we remake our thinking about sex, pleasure, and autonomy without any illusions about perfect self-knowledge. Only then will we fulfill Michel Foucault, Foucault's teasing promise in 1976 that tomorrow sex will be good again. Publishers Weekly in a starter review says, thought provoking, Angel's jargon free prose and nuanced readings of popular culture and postmodern theory enlighten. Readers will value this lively and incisive inquiry into the sexual dynamics of the Me Too era. And Olivia Lang, the author of Funny Weather, says, an ardent, rigorous, nuanced investigation into the question of consent at once illuminating and empowering a truly vital guide to navigating the difficult waters of 21st century desire. And now about today's speakers. Catherine Angel is the author of Unmastered, a book on desire, most difficult to tell and daddy issues. She directs the MA in creative and critical writing at Burbeck University of London and has a PhD from the University of Cambridge. Brianne Paz, is Professor of Women and Gender Studies at Arizona State University. She is the author of Burn It Down, Performing Sex, Valerie Solanas, Out for Blood and Firebrand Feminism, and co-editor of The Moral Panic of Sexuality and Transforming Contagion. She is the founder and director of the Feminist Research on Gender and Sexuality Group at Arizona State University, and also works as a clinical psychologist. And now I am very pleased and proud to welcome our guests for the afternoon, Catherine Angel and Brianne Foz for Left Bank Books. If everyone at home would please help me in welcoming the, them to the program. Hello, both of you. So excited to have you here today. 
Hello, thanks. Thank you. We have a great crowd already here, and I'm certain more will trickle in as the hour progresses. Uh, so I'm going to let you two, I'm going to go away and let you two have a, an incredible conversation. Audience, type up those questions as the conversation happens, and we will get those at the end. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, well, this has been such a fun book to read. So um, do you want to start by reading a little section of it for us so we can get a feel of the wonderful prose and then we can kind of dive in and have a conversation about it? Sure. So I, I thought I'd just read a little bit from um, the first chapter. So in an interview, one target of Weinstein's campaign of sexual intimidation spoke of having been afraid to poke the bear, afraid when confronted with his demands to do anything to inflame his anger, his violence or desire for retribution. In his January 2020 trial in New York, one witness told the court that if he heard the word no, it was like a trigger for him. Women are taught, not least by coercive men themselves, to care inordinately about men's feelings. They are socialized to feel responsible for men's well-being hence also for their anger and violence. Women are also taught that if they give signals, they must see things through, that if they say no after apparently showing interest, the repercussions are ones for which they only have themselves to blame. A hurt male ego is one more likely to lash out. And since much social communication is indirect, especially when fear enters the picture, women may say no cautiously, gingerly, covertly, so as to allow a man to save face and to avoid antagonizing him. A cautious no, however, can fail to be understood as a no, and its very caution and delicacy can come back to haunt a woman in courtrooms, in the realms of allegations and scrutinized behavior. Did you say no loudly enough? Did you push the bear away? Saying no then is difficult, but so too is saying yes, so too is expressing desire. For one thing, the vocal expression of desire does not guarantee pleasure for women, despite the gung-ho enthusiastic tone of much rhetoric about consent. In Michaela Cole's I May Destroy You, writer Arabella and her actor friend Terry are staying in Italy in a swanky flat in which Arabella is trying to finish her manuscript. They go out clubbing and Terry ends up leaving early navigating her way home via a bar where a local man comes onto her. Previously, we have seen him with a friend, pinpointing her. But by the time Terry meets him, he is alone. They dance, the sexual tension builds, something looks sure to develop. Then the other man arrives, they don't reveal that they know each other. From Terry's point of view, the threesome that ensues seems organic, fortuitous. When they have had sex, or rather after the men have come, the two unceremoniously get dressed in a hurry to go home, leaving Terry hanging. They acquired their pleasure, they reached orgasm, but where did hers figure? She had been up for the sex, but that doesn't preclude her feeling used and let down. Deflated, she, watch, she watches them walk down the street in complicit camaraderie. Their friendship and its concealment seem clear now. Terry has a disturbed inkling that alongside her own sexual curiosity was there maneuvering her into place through a subtle, ambiguous form of deception. Our consent, our saying yes and expressing desire, a guarantor of pleasure, do they preclude men's instrumentalization of women? Of course not. Pleasure and the right to it are not equally distributed. Saying yes and naming one's desires clearly is also difficult because of the sexist scrutiny to which women are relentlessly subjected. Many rape and assault trials turn not on whether the act took place, but on whether a victim consented. Consent then gets blurred with enjoyment, pleasure and desire. The ideal victim, as one prominent British barrister has put it, is preferably sexually inexperienced or at least respectable. Evidence that a woman has used apps such as Tinder to meet sexual partners can work against her in a courtroom, even if it's irrelevant to the allegation before the court. And a woman's willingness to have casual sex with a stranger often counts heavily against her in a trial. 
If the case in court resulted from a contact made through a hookup website, there would be, the barrister writes, little hope of conviction. You can't be raped, in other words, by someone you met on Tinder, by someone you're thought to have met out of a confident desire for sex. A woman's sexual appetite is often the very means through which male violence is exonerated. Why else, for example, would a lawyer hold up a rape complainant's underwear in court, as happened in a rape trial in Ireland in 2018? The female counsel argued, you have to look at the way she was dressed. She was wearing a thong with a lace front. The complainant's underwear stands in for her sexual desire. And once a woman is thought to say yes to something, she can say no to nothing. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. This is such a wonderful book. And I, I also wanted to hold it up so you all can see this wonderful <laughs> cover. Um, and it's a very, it's kind of a slim volume, right? So it's this wonderful kind of, you know, 125 pages packed with so many ideas that you'll be, you know, scrambling to manage all the marginalia that you write about <laughs> as you go, I promise. Um, I wondered if we could start by just asking, you know, what led you to write this book and who are you writing it for? And for you, what are the most important messages that you want readers to contemplate when reading the book? Sure. Yeah, so I wrote it um, in, in one sense over a very long period of time because some of this material was stuff I'd been thinking out for thinking about for years and years, especially the material on on sex research and definitions of sexual desire and dysfunction and um, arousal that are, that are in the book. But it was really um, in the wake of Me Too that I started, of, you know, the, the kind of resurgence of Me Too in 2017, 2018, that I started to feel really concerned about um, some of the language that was emerging from that. And in particular, the um, some of the language or, or the you know the rhetoric in a lot of kind of journalistic kind of cultural accounts of of consent and me too that while on the hand, one hand i think you know absolutely crucial consent is absolutely crucial and we have to get the law right and you know affirmative consent is i think the way forward some of the language around that seemed to me to be very insistent that women have to know what they want and express that really clearly in order to be safe from sexual violence. And I started kind of thinking about how that requirement on women in the culture puts women at a real disadvantage because it's holding them up to an ideal um, that they will inevitably fall short of at least some of the time. So because we don't because it's difficult for women, I think, to always say what they want, because we live in this culture that, you know, as I suggest in the book, uses our own desire against us. So the very thing that we are being urged in one sense to do, to say, you know, this is what I want, I'm up for this, I like this, I enjoy that, is the very thing that, that gets read out in court cases in order to exonerate men from violence. How can we then place so much burden on women to express themselves as a condition for a culture, you know, a, a good ethical sexual culture. But not only that, because if you live in a punitive sexual culture in this way, it might be really unsurprising to find that lots of women find it difficult to even know their sexual desire. And again, if that's being required of us so that we can communicate clearly to avoid sexual violence, I think that ends up protecting men and actually endangering women because really the place that I would like to get to and it's a really difficult space to get to would be a space where we allow for not knowing we allow for confusion we allow for the sort of uncertainty about what it is that we want not to be something that puts us at risk and the onus on that should should not be on us to have this perfect self-certainty that protects us we should live in a culture that allows for not being sure what we want and still protect us. Yeah, I mean, you really, you take aim at so many different things, at least implicitly, you know, college campuses, you know, say say yes, say no, you know, all, the, all their easy sort of binary ways of thinking about consent. You take aim at kind of these oversimplified, 
media sort of, you know, examples. You bring up, you know, things like the Az Aziz Ansari example and then leap over to Foucault. And then, you know, it's a it's a wonderful book in, in terms of that. And I think for me, one of the most important points of it was what you just said, where we have to think about sexual empowerment, not in these very simplistic terms, like just know what you want or, f or find out what you like or take power back or, you know, have enthusiastic consent or insist on orgasm. I mean, these are the kind of messages that women are receiving and of course, not just from the media or from their college campus or from, you know, the, the world at large, but really, you know, even from if we look at like, you know, the way that friend groups talk about sex or, um, you know, even from their families, sometimes it's sort of like these messages of being this very confident, empowered, um, assertive, vocal sort of presence is really what we hear. So I loved your analysis of how that it doesn't work that way. And how actually when we when we frame it that way, we, we do women a huge disservice. So tell me, I mean, what power do you see in not framing women's sexual empowerment as the ultimate goal of sex, but kind of broadening what sex is for to not just be about empowerment? In fact, a lot of the things you talk about are about, in some ways, like things that veer very far from what we would stereotypically consider to be empowered sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's you kind of articulated a, a really important thread of the book really nicely there, which is that actually since finishing it, I kind of, I realized that I think part of writing this book for me was a way to grapple with the nineties and the two thousands and this kind of um, real flowering of vocabulary about having to be a strong empowered woman and having to be sex positive positive. Um, and sort of being being like the the men and and you know i i live in the uk and I, you know i think there's a lot of links but there are also maybe some differences and perhaps ones that you know i'm not aware of about the us but certainly in the uk in the 90s and 2000s there was such a phenomenon whereby um women were kind of assumed to have achieved equality, you know, achieved equality socially and economically. And, you know, there were lots of female MPs and CEOs um, and the law had improved in various ways for women. And there was a rhetoric of, oh, well, now we can get on and kind of be like the men and enjoy sex and be confident and ballsy and be, and be you know, kind of sexually vulgar and, you know, all these things, which I think women absolutely have the right to be. But it turned, I think, into a sort of discourse whereby um, there was an insistence that in order to kind of show your credentials as having transcended the realm of kind of feminist anxiety, you had to actually embody what are quite, um, what are norms of masculinity. I'm, you know, not I'm not saying embodying actually what men are like, but actually what men are pressured to be like in terms of sex. So very assertive, you know, kind of acquisitive and confident. And so part of part of the book is me grappling with this idea that um, the, the way actually I think in the second half of the 20th century, a lot of the, the language around women's equality has been premised on the idea that their sexuality has to be like that of men's. And I want to question that from both angles, you know, it does women's sexuality have to be like that? And is men's sexuality even like the norms of masculinity that we think men's sexuality is? Because I don't think men are well served by this kind of, by these, you know, very rigid definitions of, of what sexuality should be like for men and women. Um, so, so part of it was me thinking about how this kind of, um, this insistence on being positive and assertive, and, you know, lots of, lots of feminist critics have intervened in that in terms of, um, you know, this idea of empowerment being ultimately very individual and allowing people to set aside the social conditions that that make sex good or bad for people and make make women or, you know, make um, all kinds of marginalized groups more vulnerable to bad sex and sexual assault. You know, lots of feminists have taken this line of, of criticizing the kind of um, insistence on a affirmation and I started to see the consent rhetoric as having got entangled with that as well this this idea that in order to like stand proud as women we have to insist on a kind of positive relationship to sex and I think that the reality for many women is very different many women experience sexual trauma and are living with that in their bodies um, 
you know, as they just go about their daily lives and that can make sex very difficult for them. And so in the book, I guess I wanted to, you know, partly to dismantle that language of sort of strength and positivity and to say, well, could we start from a, a, a realist position, which is that um, sex is frightening for a lot of people. It's a realm of, um, it's a realm of risk and fear in ways that are not actually completely disentanglable from pleasure because the pleasure of sex is also about opening yourself up to an experience uh, that you that you by definition don't know how it's you know going to happen and how it's going to end but that that vulnerability should not be used against us it should be seen as part of what it is to be human because it is we we don't know how sex is going to unfold and when we have sex all of us men included and i think that's often left you know out of the picture we we are afraid we have longing we have hope we feel insecure we feel frightened and that's where we should start from instead of kind of pushing away those things as kind of stigmatized conditions that we can't possibly bear to think about because somehow it makes us feel that we're not being good good men or good sex positive confident women and actually, I think, again, that it sets a bar that we will all at some point fail to reach. And importantly, it gets weaponized. That vulnerability gets weaponized. And that is what I want to refuse. I want us to think about the kind of the ethical riches of starting from the acknowledgement of vulnerability and thinking, OK, we're all vulnerable in this situation. How can we try to experience pleasure safely from that position. Yeah, I mean, your analysis of consent, I think, is really smart as well, because you're you're also trying to push against this framework that we, I mean, I, I see very well-intentioned progressive people even do, which is, well, if two, if two adults consent to do it, it's fine. And then the conversation ends, right? It's the strangest thing that we know sex is incredibly complicated, and yet people are very eager to um, make a very neat and tidy story about consent, you know, and, and all it takes is even the slightest push to try to unravel some of that. I mean, for example, you know, what do we do? And you and you bring this up a lot. What do we do with a culture where women are socialized to be accommodating to others, especially to men, not just in terms of sex, but just in their regular way of relating to people. And then we ask them to know what they want and to assert that. On top of that, I mean, you know, we even have you know, like the French feminists love to talk about this, that, you know, women may exist as this sort of mirror of patriarchal fantasy, right? So even the idea that they they generate their own sexual fantasies or they generate their own, you know, frameworks of sex, you know, and some, some people, including the French feminists, really push back of like, no, women operate sexually as these mirrors of patriarchal desire. So how do we like carve out a space that's outside of that? And I feel like, you know, your book's doing all these really interesting things about how do we how do we push back against oversimplified notions of consent, oversimplified notions of knowing oneself and like overvaluing that. Um, and then kind of arriving at this wonderful place of thinking about vulnerability as the way into something much more authentic and real. And, you know, as I was reading your book, it felt very much like it's one of the books that instead of relying on these kind of, you know, very superficial notions of, you know, power, thinking about power as vulnerability, I thought was so smart. So I wanted to hear you think about that a little bit more and kind of like what power is there in acknowledging vulnerability and, and using that as, as a place of, um, you know, again, not erasing these, these complexities that exist in these other things like consent and, and mm -hmm. desire. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's it's such kind of complex ground because, you know, with the consent conversation, um, you know, I think that lots of really good consent discourse and, and teachings, you know, they acknowledge that um, you don't just consent and then that's it, right? It's not, sex isn't an object. It's, it's not just a contractual exchange, that it's something that has to be ongoing and that desire can change and, you know, sex kind of emerges in this kind of unpredictable way and that has to be taken into consideration. But one of my kind of concerns with um, the language of consent 
is is actually that it's letting um, a legal language take precedence over other forms of thinking about sex that I think are really important, one of which is pleasure. Um, and so, you know, obviously the law is really important and we need to get it right. But I think partly because it's very stressful for people to think about pleasure in sex education, especially if they're talking about educating, um, you know, teenagers or children. And so the law becomes this way to avoid thinking about the more um, the more kind of murky and messy terrain. And, and there's a kind of collective investment in the idea that the law will solve this complex ground for us. You know, if we if we get the, the concept of consent right, everything will be resolved and will be simplified. And I think that's that's really wishful thinking because consent, you know, the distinction between assault and consensual sex is is vital, but there is so much sex that I think technically doesn't count as assault, but that is bad, humiliating, upsetting, painful, frightening, and wrong. And that and and that that's crucial that we're in a situation where so many people um, experience that, and you know, vulnerable people who, for whatever reason, because of you know their immigration status, or or their housing situation, or their or their socioeconomic dependence on a violent partner. That's that people agree to sex all the time because the situations that they're in give them no choice. And it seems to me that you know one of, one of the kind of really sort of tightrope acts that I do in the book that you know is quite kind of uh, fraught. For me, you know, it was fraught for me to kind of articulate because I feel like there are there are so many traps in this debate. Is that there there is a certain kind of critique of consent um, that says, oh, you know, the consent discourse is conflating bad sex and assault, and bad sex is just you know bad sex. We've all had it, you know, especially when you're young. It's just it's the inevitable kind of stumblings of learning, and you know, we we didn't cry rape. We just got on with it. I hate that rhetoric because I think that that rhetoric is resigned to bad sex and it, and it, and it kind of has this insight about the difference between bad sex and assault, but it doesn't take its thinking further. Whereas actually what we need to say is, yeah, there is bad sex, but why, why are we so okay with it? Why are boys and men being taught that women's sexual pleasure doesn't matter? Why are women being taught that good sex equates to a lack of pain or to a lack of a of an assault experience? You know, the, the bar is so low in terms of sex and our expectations of it. And so, you know, another, another one of the kind of like tricky waters is to try to say that perhaps the very thing that we're all guarding against, which is the vulnerability and frightening unpredictability of sex is actually what we have to look at instead of instead of trying to define it out of view by by focusing kind of almost fetishistically on the law and instead thinking like what you know what um what what pleasure could we try to open up for men and women that would be about um acknowledging um acknowledging that there are things we might want to try but are scared of um, or acknowledging that um, that one of the reasons sex I think is meaningful and rich for us if we're lucky you know if we if we're lucky to have good sexual experiences one of the reasons it can feel so beautiful and important is because we have entered a realm of precarity where something is at stake you know we want something and we might be disappointed and, you know, I don't like to fetishize orgasm as the, the be all and end all of sex, but I think that orgasm is really interesting because in order to reach orgasm, you have to let go. And I think, you you know, for men especially, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, in the book primarily I'm talking about heterosexual relations, um, although I think these things resonate far outside of that. But I think a lot of the the sort of anxiety around sex for men is one of, you know, performance. Or the, am I going to perform? Is my erection going to hold? Am I going to, am I going to see it through properly? And um, 
I think that's so inimical to pleasure. And I feel like part of the disservice that we do culturally to men and women is done through this kind of joyless representation of sex for men, where they can't feel what's at stake for them. They can't um, acknowledge that they are frightened and that they that there is a lot at stake. And I and I and I think that you know it's the it's like it's the defense against vulnerability that is the the root of so much violence actually i think it's not vulnerability itself vulnerability can be a place of like deep human exchange like extraordinary intimacy and closeness but it's the way in which we deny that vulnerability that's what means that it's humiliating to fail at sex or to not have a conquest or to not get what you want yeah i mean it's so much oh i just when you're talking i'm thinking of all these studies right that find when you ask men and women you know what's a bad sexual encounter or what what's good sex what's bad sex you see that the craziest divergences you know where women will say things like avoiding violence it doesn't hurt i don't feel shame about myself afterwards and men will say things like i woke up and i had beer goggles on and she wasn't as hot as i thought that she was like these crazy just the vast territory of the differences of what people even have in their sort of maps of good and bad sex right and so I yeah and I love I thought what you say in the book about men is really smart and it's really delicate and it doesn't necessarily like make space for them to be violent and it doesn't make space to make that okay which is really hard to do while also trying to offer something that at least is in the direction of an explanation maybe for why, you know, why vulnerability is so triggering in this culture. Um, and I like what you just said too, you know, I, I think about, you know, what, what do we not see in pornography, for example, right? And it's all the tiny like mishaps, right? It's, it's like, you know, like little things that happen that make sex funny or that make sex human. Those are the things that get sort of stripped away in our representations. And so again, we have, you know, like so many things loaded up for, for men not to do well, right? This kind of, again, mm -hmm. all, all of the rhetoric around invulnerability as masculinity. And then we have, you know, the, the cultural loading of like, well, what makes good sex is like these completely different metrics than women. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I don't know, I guess one of the questions I had for you, this is maybe a, a bit of an odd one, but is there any hope for men, right? And if there is any hope for men, what is that hope? Tell us about hope for men. Hope about men. <laughs> Sometimes I think a lot of women, you know, they arrive to sex and they sort of realize like this is pretty, pretty tricky, right? And your great contribution here is to this sort of what I would think is the kind of emerging field of critical heterosex studies. And I think a lot of that really is trying to think about, you know, what what do we do with men? So tell us about that. Yeah, it's interesting because um yeah, I was reading, well, no, I was listening to a podcast with uh, Jane Ward, who wrote a book recently called The Tragedy of Heterosexuality. I, th I think that's the title. I keep meaning to check the title. Um, and she talks about how um, there's this kind of normalization of kind of contempt between straight men and straight women. And that's actually part of the kind of script of heterosexuality so you know and, and feminists have long you know for decades talked about the different kind of cultural scripts we have about gender and you know in fairy tales and films and all of that but I was really struck by this thing that she said about how there's this kind of um how in some ways straight men don't seem to like women even though they're really obsessed with you know sleeping with them or getting them or you know being in relation to them but there's this sort of resignation to to some kind of sourness between between men and women and indiana serizin wrote that great article about um hetero pessimism and you know a similar thing of like of, of, of i think she was talking about sort of seeing women online being very kind of like oh i hate being straight straightness is such a curse and oh god men you know i hate them i wish i was gay you know this kind of rhetoric and and i you know, there's something kind of, uh, there can be something very funny about that discourse, I think, but but it's really troubling because I think what it does is just naturalize these these behaviors and feelings that they're taught to us, they're taught. Mm -hmm. 
it's not inevitable that men don't like the women that they want to sleep with. It's not inevitable that women feel disappointed in men because, I don't know, they don't do enough housework or, you know, I think that's often a trope in that kind of hetero pessimist sort of thing. And I suppose I feel, um, I feel like it's, I mean, you know, the first thing is that it's really important to, to emphasize how cultural this stuff is, you know, and, and part of what I do in the book, I suppose, in relation to sex research about these different models of desire is to try to keep bringing it back to the question of the different cultural worlds that we live in as men and women that I, that I do think are significantly different. And, um, and similarly with, you know, the kind of the question of like, is, is there hope? I, I sort of feel like, um, it's actually really politically important to have hope because if we resign ourselves in this way, we're seeing it as kind of inevitable that men feel so enraged at rejection that they commit murder and um, shootings. And it, we, we have to raise the bar because these are not inevitable facts about men and women, you know, that there's nothing essential about how men and women behave in these ways. It's, this kind of swamping of these scripts that make it seem inevitable that um, that masculinity is a kind of cage for men that ends up, you know, leading to so much violence towards women. And I just, yeah, I mean, as you say, it's very tricky. Like, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about it and like, oh, it's just, everything can be better because, you know, I mean, one of the really depressing things is that no matter how many like me too moments there are and great cultural shifts there are sexual violence rates stay very steadily the same it's so depressing so you know i'm not suggesting one be kind of naively optimistic about change but but i think the worst thing we can do is kind of rigidify these notions of gender such that we think it's inevitable that men approach sex in this kind of um unhappy way that ends up in so much pain and disappointment for women I I, I refuse that assumption and that's the assumption that I think we need to dismantle as difficult as it is I mean in a, as a related thing right you say that the book sort of implies that women have sex often through a lens of violence right in reference to it in a way that they can't necessarily evade violence or avoid violence all the time when having sex and that then sex becomes kind of informed by fear and fear gets sort of mixed in with desire. I mean, that's why this book is so messy in a wonderful way because none of those stories are the stories that we want to hear necessarily. And yet we know them to be true. Um, so, I mean, if violence is threaded through women's sexual lives in these ways that we can't really avoid entirely, I, I wonder, you know, after reading your book, if sexual violence is this kind of undercurrent for normative sexual experiences? And if so, if sexual violence isn't a kind of aberration or it's not something outside of the norm, what does that mean you know, for things like pleasure or vulnerability or self-understanding or, or really anything about women's sexuality? You know, like how do we, how do we understand that convergence of you know, inheriting this kind of framework of sexual violence, not as an aberration, and then also trying, trying to, you know, as you say throughout the book, this Foucauldian term of tomorrow sex will be good again, right? Like, how do we how do we make it good again through mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's one of the things that I that I felt so or have felt so disturbed about is that, you know, so so we live in this world where sexual violence is incredibly common, sexual harassment is common, sexual coercion and bullying and pushiness is so common. Uh, you know, women experience very high rates of um disappointment, pain in sex, you know, it's, the research is really depressing. Um, plus, the cultural narratives around us are often busy reminding us that whatever we do, there's some bad stuff coming down the line, you know, and often it's a form of warning. If you wear this, if you say this, if you do this, um, you know, you will get assaulted, you will end up dead. Given that, I find it enraging <laughs> that another part of the discourse in the culture is to say to women, be really positive about sex. 
you've just got to enjoy it. You've just got to find out what you like and then be confident and, you know, sassy, positive, sexual person. That That is a recipe for madness. And, and I think that, you know, part of that, that element of the book that you've drawn out is, is me trying to say, you know, we are, we are really schooled in our own death, I think, and our own future, you know, assault or future death. Like we're constantly told these stories about what might happen to us. And, you know, I don't know if you followed what's happening in the UK at the moment, the death of right. Sarah Everard and all the conversations around that, the, you know, the before that case was sort of, you know, when it was still a live case, um, the police told women in the area not to leave their homes, the, you know, the classic stay at home so that you're safe from these sexual aggressors, um, you know, and the and the the vigil that was planned was kind of violently quashed by policemen. I mean, it's just been horrendous. And so that living constantly as we are with all that stuff around us, the idea that sexuality isn't threaded through with a kind of awareness of death and a grappling with death, I think is insane. And, and that's why I think I use various kind of queer theorists in the book, partly because I think that queer theory has done such amazing work kind of contending with the AIDS crisis and with the fact that, you know, gay men were made so painfully aware of how little anyone cared about their deaths and how willing governments were to let them die. Um, and I found I find some of the writings that have come out of that so beautiful in the way they express this kind of um, this awareness and this refusal at having to convert this painful awareness into a sort of pride just like being proud about my sexuality, you know, the whole kind of gay shame sort of movement and theory. And I and I'm I'm I feel really strongly about that, which is also why I feel that, you know, sort of kink shaming is just so reprehensible. Because I think that for me, in fact, any kind of sex, not just sort of kink or BDSM sex, a lot of sex is about grappling with your own sense of mortality and the fragility of one's ego and one's life because you know giving yourself up to sex and reaching orgasm is quite a confusing sort of psychic experience <laughs> and I think that in those moments we are always kind of encountering our own mortality but all the more so if we're members of community who are made very very aware of our potential death at the hands of other people so I feel like sex is always entangled with that awareness and that that's not something that should be denied by by anyone including you know sometimes you get in you get those dynamics in sort of kink discourses about like this is not about my past trauma you know the, the representation of kink as kind of about trauma is often you know it is often used against people in that community and 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 you know we should be really careful about that but I think that if, you, if you've experienced sexual trauma and if you just live in this world which is so sexually punitive, of course sex is, is about touching those, those places of fear and like reworking through, that, through certain pains. And that's fine. That is not a ground for anyone's shaming. That's just what sex partly is. It's part of how we grapple with the difficulty of life. So... I feel like, you know, again, it's about trying to move into that space rather than sort of try to deny that it's at work in sex. I think sex is about death and it's better if we acknowledge that. Yeah, I mean, even though you're talking about it, it sort of feels like you're returning almost to the lens of someone coming to sex like in a, with new eyes or something, right? And how sex, I mean, like even for teenagers when they're first starting out is so weird. It's just such a weird space to experience and there's such there's just such different stories that are inherited in sex that are different from other things, right? And so I love mm -hmm. that the book sort of has this curious um, looking at sex with a lens of awe a little bit, like what what could sex be and what is it now and what you know what are like the darker sides of that and the more painful sides of that and what are the more potentially hopeful or optimistic sides of that. That feels like a very delicate dance, you know, mm -hmm. when we're also thinking about all of these legacies, like you said, of, you know, feminists thinking about sex, the sex wars, you know, thinking again, what you just said around, you know, BDSM kink shaming, like all of this, 
you are somehow doing that, right? Like sort of walking this line and still managing to have hope and awe and um, some kind of like hard earned optimism in this book. So I think for, for people who are watching this, I just can't recommend enough that you buy this book because again, you will not regret it. It's a very, it is a very smart book that does a ton of things in a very short amount of time. Like I'm very excited to teach this book, for example. I think students will relate to it really well because um, it also speaks to the things that, you know, younger women are dealing with, but but also really across the lifespan. I think there's a lot of these issues, like you said, that follow us about um, the fear of being vulnerable. And there's a question from the audience I want to ask you. Um, so this, this, this is the question from Lydia. I am really enjoying reading this book and listening to this conversation. Thanks so much. I'm so interested in the way that you write and speak about vulnerability. And I wondered whether you think that accepting vulnerability as a necessary, if ambivalent facet of human life can have political ramifications beyond sex and gender as well. So that's a really good question. So I thought I would throw that one at you. And if anyone else has questions, please throw them into the chat and we'll, we'll try to get to them too. That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, I think especially this year, right, haven't we all been made more aware of our collective vulnerability? You know, the fact that um, we are we are vulnerable to one another's breath, like <laughs> being being in the world can make us ill, which was always true. And of course, some people have always had to be more aware of that than others because of medical conditions. Um, but, you know, we have all globally learned this lesson anew. And isn't it also amazing how much we have learned how dependent we are on others for, um, for, for getting food, for instance, if we're self-isolating or for being cared for if, if we do get COVID and we're in a hospital and is there enough oxygen and are people developing vaccines? And, you know, and the parallels again with, you know, the AIDS um, epidemic, you know, how interesting is it when a global disease is taken incredibly seriously and resources are poured into it, vulnerability to that disease doesn't have by definition to be lethal for everybody, you know, and obviously so many governments, you know, ours both have mismanaged this at various points so badly that thousands and thousands yeah. of people deaths have occurred, which is outrageous. But I think, you know, it's been a really interesting year to think about vulnerability because of that. Um, just that, that our social life is so, we are so woven together in ways that, you know, depending on your situation, depending on your various forms of privilege, you can be more or less aware of, um, you know, I'm working at home because I can, but the people delivering my post can't work at home. The people driving the buses can't work at home. Um, so I think that, you know, it's it's been such a kind of potentially fruitful year in that respect. Um, unfortunately, it's not clear quite how thoroughgoing any of those insights have, have made other, you know, have made people partly because I think it terrifies people to think about their dependency and their vulnerability. Um, and I have to say that I, you know, one of the things I try to do in the book is, is to, is to be sympathetic to that response, right? That in the face of thinking about, um, your vulnerability to harm, your vulnerability to illness, the way in which you're dependent on other people. I understand that that can make people harden and have to push those facts away, you know, and deny that they should wear a mask or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that dynamic is actually more continuous with other other things that we that we see, for instance, you know, I quote Chanel Miller in the book who who wrote her memoir, Know My Name, about the terrible sexual assault that um, Brock Turner inflicted on her. And in that book, she talks about how sort of recovering from that assault, she had to harden herself and become kind of wooden so that she wasn't vulnerable to this violence. But that, of course, what that meant was that she also couldn't experience pleasure. She She couldn't she, she had no relationship with her own body. And she writes really movingly about sort of trying to rediscover her capacity for, for pleasure. And I think that in so many kind of different areas of life, it's understandable that that response happens in, in the wake of either kind of the threat of 
some kind of you know violence or disintegration or the actual experience of it and I have such sympathy for that process and I think we probably all have versions of that in our own lives of, of experiencing the you know the fear of what can happen when you're vulnerable and then the clamming up against it and I think you know for survivors of sexual assault it's a huge issue um but so I think um you know, vulnerability and our kind of mutual dependency on others is just a fact of life. None of us would be alive if that weren't true because we wouldn't have been fed. <laughs> um, and so the more we can think about how we are all enmeshed in relationships of dependency, the more we can think about that as an incredible virtue, as, you know, what makes social life possible. It's what makes care possible. It's what make lo makes love possible. If I'm if I'm susceptible to you, it means that I can care about your plight and that I might think about what I can do to help somebody who's more vulnerable than me. So I, I really think it is at the root of a kind of ethical impulse. And obviously different communities have to contend with this much more overtly than others. You know, people with disabilities have long known that, um, that autonomy and respect should not be predicated on some notion of kind of total physical integrity where you can just do everything yourself, this kind of idea of self-sufficiency and mastery. If that were the case, if we can only move safely and with dignity in the world, if we can do everything ourselves, people with all kinds of illness would not be afforded dignity. And so, you know, I think there are so many, there are so many areas where this, this kind of comes up and people have learned these really hard lessons. You know, the question is whether we can sort of extend that further and, and think about it as just such an inevitable part of life for all of us. And it's, you know, a lot of people defend themselves very ardently against that experience because it feels threatening to their sense of self, I think. Well, and it makes me also think about COVID, right? Like what what has COVID done to sex, which I think was another, it'll have interesting implications in what you think about in your book too, like in terms of, you know, people sort of were at the beginning of COVID, you know, but there's just now the sex research coming out, right? That's saying people were sort of having sex with their roommates like crazy. And then that abruptly stopped. And then generally people's, you know, people just withdrew from sex is sort of, you know, what we're seeing, like the, at least the studies are suggesting that there's been very big drops and, you know, all, all kinds of things, including people like wanting to have babies or, you know, the, mm. the rates of how much they're having sex, their desire for sex. And people are, you know, it's like we've created a perfect condition for people to feel um, like they can't tolerate their vulnerability, perhaps. At least when I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking that, you know, lots of fear, potential exhaustion, those, those kinds of themes that we know make people already feel so vulnerable that being more vulnerable might just be impossible. So I think you're right that thinking through this theme of vulnerability, it has such amazing implications for sexuality and specifically women's sexuality, but but really also trying to broaden that out into a bigger mm -hmm. a bigger discussion of, you know, what has, what has this last year sort of opened up in terms of, you're right, like people's, not just like their sense of vulnerability that then gets blocked through, you know, anti-mask, anti-vax rhetoric maybe, but also, you know, the ways in which like when people feel made to be vulnerable, being extra vulnerable is impossible maybe, or they just can't, yeah. can't handle it. You know, it just feels too painful. So I think we're, we'll, we'll, it'll, it'll be a long time coming that we're kind of digging out from this, but, but I do think your book will, will help us to sort of think about, I love the last chapter about vulnerability. So that's why I want to just really like push that. Cause I, I think it, it, it just opens up space rather than like closing it. Right. It sort of makes possibility rather than shutting it down. And that's, to me, the best writing does that. And I think that's really, really wonderful how your book does that. Thank you. I'm so pleased to hear it. <laughs> uh, I had a question uh, as as another audience member. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering what the kind of audience reaction or if you've gotten any uh, yet, but from women of varying ages, because I know that sex obviously is very different for like a young woman and like someone who is discovering a new sexuality while in a nursing home. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you've gotten reactions or what your, um, like what your expert opinion is on the variance between uh, sex through the ages. Mm 
Mm, that's a really good question. I'm trying. I'm trying to think about the responses to the book in in that respect. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't quite sort of pass that in my head in a way. But um, except that you know, people have like lots of different kinds of women have responded to um, to the book in really nice ways to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that. You know, that, that's one of the things that, I mean, actually, I don't go into it all that much in the book, but um, but at, at one point in the book, I talk about how, you know, some of the con conversations around consent, they are so based around uh, the idea of a kind of, uh, you know, university, undergraduate age, young men and women stumbling their way through this period uh, and navigating consent. And, and, and I think in the US, especially, that conversation has been so focused around a young, a young demographic. And um, and that's skewed, I think, that has skewed the conversation in, in all sorts of ways, not just in relation to age, um, but in relation to class um, and, and you know, just kind of social, socioeconomic demographics because, and I think in, in that chapter somewhere, I, I talk about how, um, you know, it's not just college age women and men who have to grapple with these things, it's women everywhere. It, it, at all stages of life are having to negotiate power relations in in relation to men that put them at a real disadvantage and sometimes I think that can be within you know well we know within long-term relationships within marriages within domestic situations people who have been together for a very long time where there is this kind of um, burden of expectation on women to provide sex in the same way that might they might provide other sort of domestic wifely services um, and I think that stuff is still really powerful and I think you know I don't I don't know a huge amount about um about sort of older women and sexuality and I would actually like to to know more about this but I think you know an example of where that stuff gets really interesting is like you know, Viagra, the way this blockbuster dr drug in the late 90s was this huge financial success for Pfizer. Um, although the statistics about how often people re refilled their prescriptions were really interesting because there was a lot of first prescriptions for Viagra and not so many for continuous use of it. And then, you know, lots of scholars have done really interesting research on how much you know, the, the, the whole marketing of Viagra was about the, you know, the individual mechanical dysfunction in the man's body without paying attention at all to the couple, like the relationship in which that sexuality was emerging as a problem and what the effects might have been in terms of putting pressure on women, on partners to have sex now that this mechanical problem was fixed in a man. So I think that, you know, all these questions of kind of what expectations are for sex um, in men and women and the cultural expectations around that, they're not just things affecting 21 year olds, you know, they, they go throughout the life course. And I think they don't, uh, they don't get more easy. You know, those, we're all, you know, all of our sexualities unfold in the culture that we're in. And we're constantly having to negotiate those norms in relation to our own kind of individual relationships. All right. Well, I'm. Thank you for answering my question. Uh, and we are almost out of time. This has been an incredible, really enlightening conversation. Uh, I know that many people in the audience are probably very interested. I, several have commented that they are currently reading it or are yeah, uh, <laughs> having been savoring every page and encouraging all friends, regardless of gender identity, to engage with oh. it. Um, so, Paloma. Uh, very much recommends. Uh, and I think that from this conversation, people will definitely be interested in reading this book. A reminder that it is available for sale from Left Bank Books. Uh, comment link in the comments. And also, Brianne, thank you so much for asking such incredible questions. Yeah. Uh, I did also provide a link for your book as well that we can order in. Well, we are sold out of your book, so someone uh, bought a couple. Someone bought a couple copies a couple of days ago. So, um, but thank you both for doing this event. I, from the audience, I know that they are very appreciative as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for your questions, Brianne. It was a delight to 
It was so fun. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Go buy this book. I love this book so much. I, I really, I just can't say enough how great of a book it is to add to your collection. So I hope people watching this will buy it and enjoy it. Absolutely. <laughs> To everyone watching, thank you so much. Have a fantastic weekend and have some good sex. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.